name is Dr. J.Q. Adams, Professor Emeritus from Western Illinois University. And I have a very distinguished panel with me today, and we're going to talk about social justice. So I'm going to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves, and we'll start with Rachel. I'm Dr. Rachel Wagner, and I am the Associate Director for Residence Life at Iowa State University. Um, and I recently completed my doctorate in social justice education with an emphasis on masculine performativities in diversity classrooms. My name is Tracy Davis. I'm a professor of uh, counselor, uh, uh, college student personnel. I teach in the Educational and Interdisciplinary Studies Department. And for the last four years, I have served as director for the Center for the Study of Masculinities and Men's Development. And my name's Heather Hackman. I run Hackman Consulting Group. I formerly, before that, was a tenured professor at St. Cloud State University and taught in human relations and multicultural ed, and also mostly taught pre-service and in-service teachers. Excellent. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to have some opportunities here to really kind of swing the bat. And um, I, I, I want you to give me your best <laughs> insights in, in terms of what's happening in our institutions today and, and primarily higher education uh, and what its role needs to be in terms of the issues of social justice and we can approach this from the students as well as staff uh, and, and faculty and administration so Rachel I'm gonna give you first crack um, newly minted PhD <laughs> what do you see as the challenges for our universities in the area of maintaining and implementing um, social justice? Well, it, I think there's a myriad of challenges. And one of the things that um, coming from student affairs and doing work directly um, with student ad, uh, students and administrators in residence life, I would say that one of the challenges are a lot of the systems that are in place um, make it very easy not to be awakened to mm -hmm. the ways that mm -hmm. inequity functions. So something very simp simple, like um, we have welcome barbecues at the beginning of the academic year, and we want to bring folks together, and we want to um, give them an opportunity to get to know each other and spend some time together, and we do that over food. And it usually happens at the beginning of the academic year that pretty fairly often also falls during Ramadan, for instance. Mm. And so we're breaking bread, and there are some students, for religious reasons, mm. who might be fasting, nice. who don't get to take advantage of that. Right. Um, and if you're not alive and awakened to the ways in which um, the everyday interactions in our society um, exclude some populations, then we could continue to form communities that are exclusive unintentionally. Mm. And I think it's incredibly challenging mm. to have a lens for that um, in all the ways that it can manifest on a college campus. Yeah. Excellent example. Well, I, I very much agree with what uh, Rachel said. I think it's so easy to miss the serious, uh, yet oftentimes uh, covered up, systematic level mm. of dealing with issues around difference and diversity and multiculturalism. You know, I know for my speaking for myself, um, a couple of hurdles have been particularly high for me, and one of them is privilege. Mm -hmm. Having to, having not lived in existence as uh, given a lot of my identities that are targeted for um, privilege, it's, it's hard sometimes to see uh, some of the things that happen in society that that really are marginalizing other people. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other hurdle that I would say that I've, I've struggled pretty deeply with is once, I'm, once I have some of those systems illuminated and once I see how I participate or am positioned in a way that is given a little head start, I, I, a way of framing this for me has been um, uh, what Molly Ivan said about George Bush, that uh, he uh, thinks he hit a triple and he woke up on third base. <laughs> And so when I, when I became more familiar of waking up on second base or third base, um, the next hurdle for me, and I'm sure there's more down the road, was ego. You know, I, I 
deeply wanted to get it, to understand multiculturalism and the systems of oppression. And I was on this search to try to get it more deeply. And actually, I think that search was too ego driven. Mm -hmm. It made me feel like I got it. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started understanding some of this, some of the people of color, or women, or um, people who are gay who were targeted for oppression saw my some level of consciousness and rewarded me for that. And that felt mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. And when that felt good, I kind of leaned into that. Mm -hmm. And when I focused on being a good, a good one, rather than doing this work and understanding that my own liberation is caught up in the systems of oppression and countering and challenging those systems of oppression. I, that's kind of where I am now, trying to become more conscious. And I'm sure there are hurdles, as I am still very unfinished, I'm sure there's hurdles I'm going to run into uh, post-ego, post-getting some sense of privilege. Um, so those are some of the, the hurdles that I see that I've struggled with and I, and I see people struggling with on campus. Okay. Heather, I'm going to kind of direct a question and that you. Um, when I began framing this, you know, I said, how do we maintain it? And so I think I need to clarify that. Because I think a lot of times the work we do in terms of social justice on university campuses are driven by events or, you know, yeah. topical kinds of things. Yeah. My, f one of my first entries was the apartheid movement mm. and the fight against that and trying to bring campuses to conscious about their investments in South Africa right. and the damage that was doing. Um, but once that was solved, <laughs> whether it's ever been solved, <laughs> but once that, you know, Mandela was released and the Freedom Camp, we didn't have those kinds of conversations anymore right. about investments. So, so my question to you is, you know, how do we explore those systems, okay, that um, oftentimes universities are party to, yeah, yeah. to keep them exposed, to keep them in our consciousness so that we can, you know, work, work against the, the negative effects that they can have. Yeah. That's a good question. I think, um, well, first of all, I just want to say I didn't know there was a place called Post Ego, but I'm very excited <laughs> to get there. I hope that that happens someday because um, uh, I'm, I'm plagued, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that's a result of privilege, as you were talking mm -hmm. about. It's just, it's a, it's a really intense relationship between um, r not just having privileges, but having one's, the essence of one's identity so deeply tied to the structures of those privileges mm -hmm. that it feels like the elimination of privilege is the annihilation of myself. Mm -hmm. And wow. in reality, it's really, there is a coming undone that has to happen for dominant group members, but it's not an annihilation. It's just the coming undone of the old story of privilege uh, and the ways that my life has fit into or not systems of oppression. And so, um, and so I thought about that when you said post-ego. I'm like, really? Awesome. <laughs> That'd be great to get there. Um, and instead, for me, it's been that process of coming undone. And to your question, I think that universities and colleges need to do that as well. I think one of the challenges to tie the first and second question in is that many institutions actually don't even know what they're talking about when they say social justice or equity. They're really operating from diversity or cultural competency frameworks, and I think I went into all that in the last conversation we had, so I won't go again, but, but they're not defining social justice clearly. And then to speak more clearly to your point, they're not tying it into mission and identity in a way that's actually meaningful. It's a tokenized representation. And so that tokenized representation is what they use in recruitment materials and in many of the ways, you know, those first year students that you see. But it's not part and parcel to the board's decision about how they are going to manage their institution. And so I think that part of the reason those conversations die out is because the core of an institution has not aligned itself with the deep mission and value of social justice. But more importantly, or, or not more importantly, but in a slightly broader way, a mission of educating for the future, educating for change, educating for um, values and beliefs that this particular society purports um, to be part and parcel to who we are, you know, democracy, freedom, critical thinking, engagement, et cetera. And so I don't find a lot of institutions that actually, if you were to ask them behind closed doors, is this really what you're about? Mm -hmm. They would say, no, our business is bolstering our endowment. Our business is getting better 
numbers Absolutely. for ACT and SAT scores in our, you know, the students that we admit. Mm -hmm. Our business is climbing up the ladder of U.S. News and World Reports rankings. Uh, we are about the business of education, not about education as a service to society. And so I think uh, at the heart of your question about how do we keep these conversations going really is about leadership in higher education making a choice, making a choice, a 21st century choice. And, you know, I tie that in a lot with issues of, of climate justice, climate change, and climate disruption. And I got to give a lot of props to Stanford University, who just on Thursday, I think it was, divested all their holdings in coal. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the largest university to do so up to this point. And so the divestment movement is kicking in again around climate mm -hmm. change, trying to get institutions to divest from carbon, period. Now, Stanford just did coal. They didn't do carbon as right. a whole. But other institutions have done carbon, and cities and counties are doing carbon as well, saying we are going to become zero carbon cities or counties or you know, uh, urban metropolitan areas as a whole. Um, and so I think that would be an example of an institution looking ahead and saying, this might take a short-term hit to our endowment, but in the long term, this is what actually will benefit our students and benefit society. And are we in the business of business or are we in the business mm -hmm. of deeply and profoundly, uh, profoundly educating people for the future? Um, and so I feel like many higher ed institutions have lost their way, if they ever had that way in the first mm -hmm. place, um, in being more about the dollar and the bottom line than being about serving this society, particularly a land-grant institution which I graduated from. We both just graduated, or you just graduated from. Land-grant institutions are, their whole mission is to serve society, not to worry about endowments, not to worry about enrollments mm -hmm. and, and the bottom line. And some would say that's a horribly naive approach because you can't operate an institution with no money. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is let your values lead your work instead of the dollar lead your work. Mm -hmm. And then we will start to see institutions with the courage and capacity to lean in to the hardest issues that tie into social justice content in this society. Excellent, very nice. Mm -hmm. Now piggybacking that, I'm gonna turn to our student folks who do a lot of interaction um, in, in terms of how do we help the students prepare themselves. Um, and either Rachel or Trace, you can take this. So if we can get <laughs> the leaders to, to follow suit, how do we begin to work with the students to develop the consciousness uh, within them so that they can, when, when they matriculate, they'll carry that into their own fields and vocations. Well, I was thinking, um, and I know we said we wouldn't really talk about K through 12, but I, I spent a year teaching third grade. Awesome. And I will tell you that in a um, working class, uh, predominantly African-American neighborhood, in Ohio and those children spent more time standing in line, getting in line, moving in line from one class to the next um, in the morning when they were dropped off to recess, mm -hmm. to lunch, back mm -hmm. from lunch, mm -hmm. to art, back from art. Um, mm -hmm. They spent more of their day mm -hmm. learning how to stand quietly in line than they did probably anything else mm -hmm. in terms of time on task and um, for me that's really poignant because of the way in which when I reflect on my own education, how much of it was about breeding obedience mm. and being a repository for other people's knowledge mm. that was deposited mm. in. Mm. And so I think about, um, I mean, Heather talked about it in our last session, structures and pedagogies that flip that, um, situate learning and students' experience, um, invite them to question, to interrogate, to um, be curious, instead of rewarding um, obedience, silence, um, you know, following direction into a sort of numbing mindlessness. I, I really love what, what uh, Rachel said. I think it is almost kind of an unlearning process. Mm -hmm. And again, speaking from my own experience, when I first started understanding what happens around us, when I started becoming conscious of how systems of oppression work, well, first of all, we have to look at a theory of oppression and yeah. believe that it's not some horrible thing that's, that somebody made up. But once you start realizing it's just the way things are, mm -hmm. um, it was an unlearning process. I think sometimes our students 
uh, you know, they've, they've come to us, at least in college, with 18 years of learning uh, that this is the way the world was. I can relate deeply to that. Now, sometimes I forget it, and I think one of the things we need to do for our students is not forget that, mm -hmm. is not forget that, um, that I have a lot to learn, mm -hmm. had a lot to learn, and still have a lot to learn. I'm still in process. Mm -hmm. And when I remember that, um, sometimes I get myself out of the way. And students today, I think, do have a lot of passion for doing social justice work. I think the one thing that I see missing isn't the passion or the desire or the need to help our planet to reduce racism, to reduce sexism and homophobia. I think those things tend seem to be there. I think the one thing that sometimes is missing is very close to what Dr. Hackman just talked about in the session we were just in, and that's confusing diversity or, or multicultural competence with social justice. Those systems aren't often illuminated. Mm. One of the things that I'll say to students uh, now, for example, is follow the money. Yeah. Look at, look at what, yeah. why things happen the way that they happen. Mm -hmm. If you put systems together with money, uh, uh, you'll figure some things out. Mm -hmm. Now that's cloaked very often. Mm -hmm. We have a pretty good ad campaign going on mm -hmm. that sells a hegemony of, well, this is, you know, we're doing the right thing. You know, the common sense hegemony that this is, we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. We need to interrupt that and students can interrogate that. I was afraid to use, for example, some critical theory in a graduate course. I thought, you know, Peter mm -hmm. McLaren and mm -hmm. some other, uh, Henry Giroux, mm -hmm. um, pretty abstract, meaty stuff mm -hmm. and once I used it I, I, I they, they got it yeah. it's so true um, now some of it has to be translated pretty well some mm -hmm. of the uh, yes Dr. Hackman mentioned Paul Ferreri's Pedagogy of the Oppressed that's probably not the first one I'm gonna <laughs> have even graduate students read um, but uh, some some more accessible critical theory one last thing is I, I, I work with a lot of young men in this center and one of the things that I've learned uh, that I've related to and that I see in other young men is we don't like to be told kind of what to do. Well, I think mm -hmm. that's adolescence in general. It's not just about masculinity, but there's something particular about being your own man. And I think uh, I've seen men when you raise the, the possibility that you're not defining who you are, you're not making that self-definition of what masculinity or how you're gendered, mm -hmm. Um, somebody else is doing that for you, it, yeah. can, it can stimulate some pretty strong resistance. Yeah. And there's a place to go for critique and, and liberation once, once we get act, uh, activate that uh, kind of resistance against the, the hegemonies that are being sold to yeah. us. Nice. I would say the flip side of that uh, is that you actually have to have faculty that can do that. Mm. Uh, and I think the preparation of faculty on most of our college campuses is um, bad at best, abysmal, abysmal mm -hmm. at worst. Mm -hmm. um, absent. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is that, um, I think I've mentioned this in conversation with some of you before, is that it's assumed that if you can get a PhD or an EDD in something, then you can actually teach it. Mm -hmm. And th I don't think anything could be farther from the truth because mm -hmm. that implies that it's really just the transfer of information. And teaching is an art, it's a science, it is a passion, it is something that is incredibly difficult to do when it's done well. Mm -hmm. um, and it is constantly changing. And one of the things that it demands of the person who is engaging in it is that that person is ever evolving in their practice. And that means that they have to consistently evolve as a human being. And there's something that's so static about higher education on the faculty side that once you've got your doctorate, you don't need to learn anymore. And once you've got that doctorate, you can certainly teach because it's just transferring information. And once you've got that doctorate, you're really good. You know, just just keep your head down, get tenure, and you know, do what you need to do. And I think it's a profound disservice to education when we structure higher education in that way, because students might be willing to engage critically. They might be willing to think about these issues. They actually might be willing to get up and get active and do that. But if there's no faculty that can actually provide that space for them in every major across the entire campus, then where are they going to get that? And so um, I find myself consistently disappointed uh, in the way that faculty in the United States engage uh, in the art and science of what they do, in the passion of what they do. And that, you know, certainly the humanities and social sciences um, emphasize those relational components and that can help in 
um, classroom pedagogy, but I was a molecular biology major in my undergrad, and I was incredibly fortunate to have brilliant teachers who engaged with a lot of passion in the work that they did and made profound connections and forced us to make profound connections. But that was just in the biology department. The physics and chemistry wanted nothing to do with it. Biology made us take our classes to stimulate the other side of our brain and mm. think spatially. Mm. And so we had to nice. take studio art classes if you were a biology major. Chemistry and physics didn't care about it. And so I just watch um, the siloed, kind of camped out, mm. here's my territory in my field in higher ed, do a profound disservice to just what it feels like to be a faculty member, but really to students. We are not serving them well. And this really should be about interdisciplinary. We, yeah, t we say agree. that all the time, oh, but yeah. how many people are practicing it? That's really fascinating. I want to go back to Rachel's opening comments because I thought that your example you gave was just really yeah. excellent. And, and so what I'm going to ask you is, how do we become more conscious of the big picture? Because mm -hmm. what you gave an example was back to food and fashion and you know, mm -hmm. that, that part of diversity that uh, mm -hmm. everybody loves, mm -hmm. you know. But not seeing the underlying, mm -hmm. okay, um, uh, disrespect that you have to a segment, in a growing segment, of your student population. So how do we widen the view? How do we <laughs> widen the lens so that we see more, but also see deeper, that we see, you know, in between the calendar, right. as we say? in between the spaces. Right. How do we see in the spaces? Well, ha spending time doing a doctorate in social justice education, I mean, one of the privileges of that um, and the luxuries of that is I was introduced to a lot of frameworks that I think spur thinking in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I think about like the campus climate framework and Hurtado et al, um, Milam and um, inclusive excellence, the um, some of Kevin Kumashiro's work in terms of um, asking questions about who's othered by this experience mm -hmm. instead of education about the other, mm -hmm. um, education about um, who's being othered mm -hmm. or um, how is othering occurring. Those are all, I think, really strong um, models or frameworks or tools that can be leveraged to take a look at our departments, our units, our residence halls. Um, I use a, I mean, essentially, it's a rubric that mm -hmm. was um, riffed off of the campus climate framework to take a look at everything from when you walk in our offices, what art do you see on the wall, mm -hmm. what music is playing in the background, what does our mission statement say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where do we spend most of our money, mm -hmm. what kind of programming, who comes, mm -hmm. what are the demographics of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's lots of tools that can help you start asking questions to do a sort of um, internal departmental inventory. Good, <laughs> good. Um, mm. And invite folks into that conversation. And one of the things that I think is powerful about it is um, it allows us to do some interrogation work mm. in order to do problem solving. And sometimes I feel like with, with critical frameworks, we, do, we surface a lot of stuff mm. and then don't know what to do with mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so um, bringing communities together to build capacity to take a look at ourselves in the workplace, which doesn't feel quite as scary as taking a look at ourselves internally, mm -hmm. although that's important too. Yeah, mm -hmm. Vital. <laughs> um, but sometimes you have to start somewhere, and for some folks, public space is easier. I especially have seen patterns around some of my white male colleagues being more comfortable interrogating sort of the workspace before interrogating some of their own experiences around social group identity. Um, but taking some time with that and then um, not engaging in blame, not engaging in how come you didn't know this yet, mm -hmm. maybe asking the question of, boy, there's probably really good reasons why we don't know this. There's systems in place, mm -hmm. looking up, mm -hmm. to speak to my colleague to the left, systems in place that um, take our attention away from this and instead think it's you person in front of me who's manifesting mm. this oppression, right. right? And some sort of malevolent intentionality <laughs> that often doesn't exist, but mm. just seeks to divide us from mm. each other. Um, so 
instead saying, look, we got here. There's probably really good reason that we got here. We could spend some time um, uh, dissecting that. What do we do with it? Because mm -hmm. is this who we want to be as an organization? And I've found when I start those conversations, people aren't like, yeah, sign me up for the exclusive organization. <laughs> yeah. That's where I yeah. would be. Yeah. You know? right. yeah. So. Yeah. Nice. One thing I'd add, I, I love the, when you think about consciousness, the, the, um, like what's on our walls and what books do we mm -hmm. have? And mm -hmm. Actually, uh, JQ, I've seen you do this with some of our college student personnel students, handing them a book or making a recommendation to read uh, Franz Fanon, for mm -hmm. example. I've seen transform young African American men into mm -hmm. a journey of hold it, I have some things that I didn't, why, why wasn't this in my curriculum? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you say, right, right, and th you, this needs to be in your curriculum. Mm -hmm. And you, you've, uh, there's been a reason why it's not, and let's start the journey now, um, which I thought was beautiful. The, the, other, the other thing that, uh, in terms of consciousness, I'm thinking of, of uh, as I, I just had two students in my office, one African American, uh, and one uh, Euro background. And they were talking about this Princeton student's discussion yeah. of pri denial of privilege. Yeah. And hmm. during, during the conversation that they had bef you know, outside of the classroom just with each other, caused some um, issues around shame. This, this Euro uh, student felt very shamed that, uh, that his privilege was being called out, and they didn't treat this guy from Princeton very well. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought, in terms of consciousness, there's all kinds of landmines that were keeping him from, uh, you know, kind of, he, he kept trying to run away from mm -hmm. some of the difficulties and trying to see the, the, the kind of material impact that this denial of privilege can have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was interesting, the consciousness of this young Afri African American woman was pretty spectacular. Like she was cutting, slicing, and dicing, and even <laughs> was empathetic mm. towards this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. man of privilege. I thought it was a beautiful thing. And then mm -hmm. somebody who was positioned like I was was really kind of this was so new to him. Mm -hmm. And so I did kind of a flip with him, asking him to to think of how this journey of feeling some sh shame or guilt that really isn't going to be productive. Right. Uh, to get beyond that is his way, because he really deeply wants to understand African Americans and racism and sexism and other forms of oppression, to, to, to view this as his opportunity, his education, for maybe beginning to see how the systems have harmed people and targeted people for oppression. That you're working through that guilt might be parallel to an African American working through anger of being the target. That you're working through that guilt and shame might have something very productive on the other side right. if we can take the backward step, the mm -hmm. Zen backward step, and create space to say, wow, this really sucks, this really is painful, but maybe there's some value in staying with it mm -hmm. for now. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Heather, I can tell you want to... No, I'm good. You're I'm good? good? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Um, our old friend Dinesh D'Souza is at it again. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't heard, he has a new film coming out, and mm. it's called America, mm. okay? I, I call him the um, capitalist apologist. Yeah. Um, Does quite well at that. Yes, mm -hmm. and he's, he's very good at that. And in and, and this one, he's asking the question of um, what would the world be like if there was no America, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a thought for you, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but once again, he's almost an instrument for saying white privilege is okay. Um, Colonialism was okay. Yeah. Um, he admits to these things, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. um, but he still apologizes in, in, in the sense of, but look at the good that's come from them. And I think, you know, that's what you're saying about the, the young man that was in your, in your office is it's very difficult to criticize something that has given so much privilege to so many. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, that so many tends to be located in. North America and Europe, yeah. <laughs> you know, but um, um, so how do how do we counter the the, the Susans? Mm -hmm. How do we counter those that are putting forth a whole bunch of effort and a whole lot of capital, okay, to maintain the belief in 
things like meritocracy and other myths. And anybody can jump in. Yeah, yeah I think um, I think that you were saying beautifully earlier, broaden the lens, broaden the lens. And I think if we look just at a particular set of me, at a particular set of ends, rather, um, through a very finite lens, I actually think it is possible to argue that those things are good. But if you broaden the lens in terms of the ends, and then you deepen the lens in terms of the means, there is no way to say that the end result of the United States and what it means to be this particular society in this historic moment and all of the prices that have been paid by hundreds of millions of people in the process of that coming about, that that's legitimate. Mm -hmm. And so if I operate from a really finite lens of uh, uh, measuring the success of this nation, for example, through just the GDP, like how are we doing as a country? Let's look at our GDP. Instead of measuring in a sense of are we happy? Mm -hmm. Are we kind? Mm -hmm. Are we civil? Mm -hmm. Have gun, have gun violence gone down? Mm -hmm. You know, has rape and sexual assault gone down? Mm -hmm. Has the wealth gap decreased mm -hmm. instead of increased? Like if we just measure it by these tiny, tiny frameworks, which my experience of Dinesh D'Souza is he very selectively picks historic moments, yes. but always funnels yes. them into this incredibly narrow, narrow mm -hmm. view. And so if we do that cherry picking to a narrow view, then you can argue, absolutely. But when we look systemically and we look deeply historically, um, the violence that has been exacted on so many people in so many ways has so fundamentally dehumanized this society, so undermined who we are, our values, our beliefs, our traditions, who we purport to be. It's made it so impossible for us to actually face that stuff, that our only option is consume, consume, consume. So post September 11th, I mean, I live in Minnesota. I didn't hear George Bush say, bring hot dish to your neighbor, which I still don't really know what hot dish is after all these years. I'm not sure what's in it. But it's a yummy thing, and you're supposed to take it to somebody when they're not doing well. And that wasn't said. There wasn't a conversation about be kind, be generous, be forgiving. There wasn't conversation about come together as communities. He told us two things, shop and travel because he's concerned about those industri industries, but more importantly, I think that he said that because he knew there was an audience for it, mm -hmm. because we do shop and travel. Mm -hmm. We have an identity around consumption that's connected to our sense of class, that's connected to our sense of entitlement through U.S. isolationism and U.S. exceptionalism. And so I think there's a real problem with the narrow scope of Dinesh D'Souza and other people like that who articulate um, a, a vision that the ends always justify the means. And that is an incredibly bankrupt, morally, spiritually, and ethically bankrupt space. Because mm -hmm. then all bets are off, mm -hmm. you know, and he's mm -hmm. next. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, Rabbi New or, or Pastor Martin Neumar's poem is, you know, and then they came for, and then they came for, and when they came for me, there was nobody left. So I'm curious what Dinesh D'Souza will say when he gets over for, pulled over for driving while brown. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I love America. It's great. Don't mm -hmm. you know who I am? White police officer? I've been an apologist for your, <laughs> your policies for a really long time. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the good guys. And it's like, I don't care. <laughs> License and registration, care. please. And so at some point, the system that he's defending mm -hmm. will come back on him mm -hmm. because that's what it's designed to do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'm disappointed in those kinds of messages and the amount of space that people like him take up in our mainstream conversations, mainstream corporate media, mainstream consciousness, because it squeezes out the capacity for more complicated conversations that are necessary. His film, 2016, made $48 million. Yeah. One of the most successful documentaries in, in history. So there is an audience out yeah. there that that loves that kind of information and loves that kind of spin. Um, I call it the Kool-Aid drinkers of America. <laughs> um, <coughs> and, and they're taken intravenously these mm. days. Um, but that, I think, is some of the role of education and certainly a social justice education is to be able to develop the filters so that one is not hypnotized or seduced by those kinds of messages, mm -hmm. but have the ability to see clearly through. Um, but yeah, and to but find solace to the fear, I think sometimes what yeah. happens in social justice circles right. is that we get all 
biz cranky yeah. and the, about the system and rah, you know, and yeah. get really intense. And I, I guess I should speak for myself. And certainly in my 20s, I was mad about everything, you know, and end, end this now. <laughs> what is it? I don't know, but end that thing too. You know, I, I just had, I was so charged up and fired up about it. And what I had no capacity to do was help someone who was responding um, to me through resistance to assuage their fear of what will it look like on the mm. other side of this. I had no tools, no capacity to say, I know that your privilege is more than just a system to you. I know that it's the thing that gives you a sense of safety, security, comfort, peace in this world. And I was not effective in offering something more profound, offering a better solution uh, that would have been a salve to that fear. And so I think some of it is Kool-Aid drinkers, but I think some of it reach, some people reach for Dinesh D'Souza and others like him because it feels like such an easy fix for the fear. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like, yes, yes, somebody understands that I'm really terrified. Yeah. And so I think it's been a consistent failing in some social justice circles, not all, certainly, not all movements, and, but in some ways, in some quarters, that we actually haven't led with the heart in a deep and profound way. And I think the works of Bell Hooks and Cornell West, those are folks who relentlessly lead with the heart and say, before we get to the system, I just need you to know I love you no matter what. Mm, nice. And then out of that space, they can say, and I need to talk to you about your white privilege. And, you know, and, then, <laughs> and that makes somebody a little more uh, open to listen. Yeah, it needs to be palatable, and, yeah. and that, that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a very important one. And, uh, you know, I'm, as we are watching these global scenes take place, and we're seeing this incredible friction between the two largest organized religions on the planet mm -hmm. in terms of the many variations of Christianity, many variations of Islam. Mm -hmm. And um, Islam's taken it right in the eye a lot these mm -hmm. days because, you know, well, who has the monopoly on terrorism in the world? Well, it's those, you know, Islamic people and stuff. And But nobody oftentimes examines the the input of these big huge western nations driven by their um, Christian belief systems that do a lot of collateral damage mm -hmm. and so it's like is death different is it okay for the collateral damage and not okay for quote-unquote the terrorists mm -hmm. it's still somebody's son dead it's somebody's daughter dead it's somebody's mother dead it's mm -hmm. somebody's father dead and we know what that then creates, greater resistance and the possibilities for more conflict. Mm. So, big picture question <laughs> again <laughs> for my social justice advocates mm. here. How do we begin to work that problem? How do we really punctuate that love so it's love across those kinds of differences? So here, those differences are coming to play in very tragic and very violent ways. But how do we get that love message across to hum human beings. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about when um, Heather was talking is uh, I was at a conference, I was at a higher education conference probably four years ago now, and I got my program and like the nerdy kid I am, I read all of the explanations of what people's mm. scholarly papers were on, and everyone that had the words multicultural or um, diversity or social justice in them, I circled them and I tried to get to every single one. And it was probably a good two days into the conference, I was listening to a panel of really talented doctoral students of color talk about their research and um, they're, they're bright, thoughtful, reflective, engaged, um, mostly qualitative research, um, that I noticed that one of the themes of all of the conversations that I've been listening to over the last two days were coming up with like increasingly sophisticated ways to describe how racism functions. Mm. Um, in higher education. In fact, I, I listened to one young woman talk about um, her, s her interviews of um, you know, 20 or 30 doctoral candidates across the country um, to uh, 
suss out that racism happens in doctoral mm. programs. And, right. and I was thinking of, while I'm listening to this that of course it is. I mean, racism is present in all institutions, in all parts of society. It's not a surprise that it's in doctoral programs. It would be an amazing surprise if it wasn't in doctoral yeah. programs. Mm -hmm. That would be a lovely <laughs> thing yeah. Yeah. to like spend some good scholarly energy, intellectual energy on. But for me, that moment crystallized in terms of s some of my own work and scholarship on how much intellectual and emotional energy mm. I have invested in finding new ways to convince the disbelievers mm. that a problem exists. Mm. And who does that serve? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so today I make a daily practice. I get up in the morning and I you know, do my morning um, uh, piece and Part of it is I make a decision. I am going to encounter sexism and racism and heterosexism and classism today. I am going to encounter it. I get it. Um, and I'm instead going to direct my attention to the wonderful manifestations of um, a more liberatory way of engaging mm -hmm. yeah. other humans yep. mm -hmm. in the world. And when I find those moments, I'm going to treasure them. I'm going to chronicle them. Mm. I keep a list. Mm. And I spend my energy connecting with other folks um, and engaging with them around what are the conditions that are allowing this to surface and how do we make more of it? Mm. You know, where are the threads here mm. that we could proliferate? Um, and, and I was a workshop um, addict <laughs> in mm. college and graduate school and um, and post-grad. I went to every racism workshop and lecture and thing on a college campus and those were those moments where I got to um, breathe and think and um, one of the things that I, I didn't experience until maybe the last seven years is um, framing those conversations around dreaming and visioning mm -hmm. and nice. hope nice. and what kind of world are we trying to work towards mm -hmm. and and having conversations with each other about what does it look like mm -hmm. and what does it feel like <coughs> so that we can bring it into the room and let it you know let it ground us let it center us um, in terms of what we're trying to work towards I I'm very concerned about how much intellectual energy I have spent trying to convince um, someone else, sometimes a sort of um, ephemeral someone else out there, mm. that um, X, Y, and Z is a problem. Yeah. No more. Yeah. You know? That's nice. I've had some beautiful conversations with Rachel over the years, and we've actually written together, and it hasn't always been, uh, we haven't always <laughs> been on the same page. We've disagreed. We're you might notice that we might be positioned a little differently identity-wise, <laughs> and uh, some of those conversations, we've uh, gone back to our people and sought solace for the difficulties that we were struggling with. And, you know, I, I think we both were trained in ways that <laughs> made it easy for us to take inventory of each other, mm. um, and then finding a way to understand, seek understanding as opposed to seeking to be right. You know, you talk mm. about the academy and how we're taught to be professors or how we're taught to be teachers. Mm. You know, I was taught to be right. I, I was taught <laughs> to try and give the truth. And I, 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 it, every time I focus on that, I, I, I mess up. Mm. Every time I create space for seeking understanding as opposed to debating to be right. I mean, debate has its place. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but too often I, I, I don't use, envision what that looks like to be collaborative, or I don't envision what it looks like to be humble, or I don't think of compassion and love. And I'm reminded recently I've re uh, took a look, uh, taken a look at um, the speech that Dr. King did the night before he was mm. assassinated. There's actually a really good play going on yes. uh, right now about the night before Dr. Right. King was the assassinated. Mountaintop. The mountaintop, mm. yes. Fantastic. Highly recommend it. Right. But in the two minutes, and this isn't part of that play, but in the two minutes uh, at the end of his speech, it becomes pretty clear that he's going, he knows he's going mm -hmm. to die. Mm -hmm. 
And when I think of love, I think of, of my partner who I fell in love with, you know, and the, the, the rich depth of emotion that I have that I, might, makes me want to be around this person. Not what it would be like to look at somebody else who I don't agree with and who actually may want to kill me and find a way to love that person as mm. Dr. King did. That's a kind of love that I aspire to. I don't quite understand, but I think, I think he's figured some things out mm. that, that I need to, to lean into a little more. And it's interesting you started this conversation out about framing this around religions. And uh, mm. I think of both Gandhi and King who come from different faith backgrounds who figured out ways mm to not use the oppressor's tools to interrupt nice. the oppressor. Yeah. And uh, I think there's something there. I, I don't have it figured out, but uh, I'm gonna keep leaning into it until I figure some other things out. Nice. I think an additional point that I would add to that is the burgeoning conversation in social justice fields around um, the role of trauma and trauma recovery. Mm -hmm. And this is really coming out first out of um, communities of color, particularly women of color who've been talking in uh, multi-generational, multiple native communities as well as multi-generational African American communities talking about the legacy of trauma and what that does. And Joy DeGruy wrote Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome and it's a really powerful piece talking uh, about the ways that that plays out intergenerationally, historically. Um, but there's also the flip side of that in the ways that it plays out for members of dominant groups as well, in that uh, in moments where I've read everything about white privilege that could possibly be read, but in a moment where I am uh, triggered into a space of really intense fear around these dynamics, because I have been socialized to see, as I said earlier, my survival as a white person wrapped up with the maintenance of the social order as it is. And so white privilege and white supremacy have actually hijacked my response processes so that I feel like I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. I feel like nice. this is the end. Nice. I feel like if this changes, I don't know what's gonna happen. The whole world's gonna go to, I mean, you heard that with LGBT marriage rights, like what did, what's next, you're gonna marry a tree? I mean, it was so right. absurd. But what that really spoke to was people's profound sense of, I will have no way of orienting myself in this world if this changes. And that's really about that deep survival response that has been co-opted. It actually doesn't really show up in the frog brain. I think the Atlantic two years ago, this could be a false reference, but I think the Atlantic magazine ran a study, a story about a study, where they wired people's brains up and showed them, multiracial people, pictures of different racial groups, and the frog brain did not fire. Mm. The medial and frontal cortexes are mm. what fired. Mm. And so that tells yes. us that my fear response, what I perceive to be this threat, is actually a socialized process yes. mm. and not a true process yes. of threat. I have been taught to see people yes. of color and native people as a threat. And so therefore, dismantling this system that I perceive to have protected me for so long means my demise. Yeah. And so I say all that long blah blah to say that one of the ways to get into how do we deal with such intense global conflicts is not only to, to embody love and hope and really have a vision, but to also recognize the processes that people are going through and give them tools for resilience that actually aren't at all about understanding a system of oppression and are really about coming into a grounded, present sense of themselves mm -hmm. and realizing that, no, I won't die in this moment. No, I actually don't need to fight here. I don't need to flee. I don't need to freeze. I don't need to fold. I actually have the capacity to stay fully present. And even though I deeply and profoundly disagree with you, or I'm deeply and profoundly upset with what's happening right now, I can still stay. Yeah. And I think that's one of the pieces that if we realize that our dinghies actually are tied to each other mm -hmm. and we make a commitment with that knowledge to say, I won't leave, I won't leave, I won't leave, I won't leave because I love you, I won't leave because we have a, a vision of something better, and I won't leave because I'm not going to fall prey to what I believe, um, what my body might be trying to tell me in this moment, which is get the heck out of here. Mm -hmm. 
And so what happens when I say to you, I won't leave, as a white person saying to a person of color, I will not leave you, wow. no matter what? I just got chills. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> that's really profound because that's the work I do. I work in communities where white flight is either taking place or has happened. Mm -hmm. And that phenomena is so extremely powerful and so extremely costly yeah. in so many different ways. Uh, especially in the role of education and maintenance of communities. And um, we know that when, you know, quote unquote, stable white communities, whatever that means, reach about 8% of change, mm -hmm. the trickle starts to become a flood. Mm -hmm. And you will get a flip within 10 to 15 years. You can see whole communities will flip mm -hmm. uh, in that time period. And, and so it's an incredible phenomena to observe. Mm -hmm. And when you task people as to, why you're leaving, they will give you all these bizarre, you know, reasons for why they're yeah. doing it. And it's never about the neighborhood's changing, <laughs> you know, there's people of color coming in. No, it's crime, it's devaluation mm -hmm. of property, the schools are going down, but they never name it. Mm -hmm. They never name what the real fear mechanism is, as you would call the trigger is for them leaving. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it's extremely profound what you're saying because if indeed we are sisters and brothers in a larger scope of things, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be abandoning your sister and brother. That's exactly right. Okay, that. because you know, there's more that you have in common than you will ever have apart. But if we're caught up in just the surface, mm -hmm. if this is about the melanin count, mm -hmm. then uh, you know that's fairly silly and that's certainly <laughs> something that's learned. Um, and, you know, we've got a lot of work to do, as we know we do. Mm -hmm. But, boy, how do we get folks to say, I'm not going to leave? Because um, it is the answer. Because if you don't leave, then the neighborhood doesn't really change, does it? Mm -hmm. Or it changes in a way that it accommodates folks, okay? But it's, a, it's, a, it's more than just a physical commitment, because it's possible for people to say, I'm not leaving with their shotgun in right. hand, oh, yeah. defending oh, their yes. land. So oh, yeah. the kind of leave is, my heart will not abandon you. Yeah. I will not close my heart off to you, mm -hmm. or to this process, or to this space. And so the kind of I won't leave, it's, it is certainly about that physical reality. Mm -hmm. And I think Detroit is an interesting example mm -hmm. of some of that. Mm -hmm. But it's really, and I, I, this is certainly not a thought of my own. Many other great thinkers and spiritual teachers around the world already live by this and know this. But it's really about I refuse to hate more and love less. I refuse is that I will not close my heart ever. And to do that uh, requires not courage in the traditional sense, but a sense of, of resilience or a capacity for resilience that is stronger than the seduction of a system of privilege. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, if we start to teach undergrads that, then the revolution will be well underway mm -hmm. in many ways. Because I will always come back to my core humanity if we can teach that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> That's an excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm ready. <laughs> okay. right. well, sign me up. Right. <laughs> sign me up for that one uh, and stuff. And and indeed, we have to keep modeling it, don't mm -hmm. we? Mm -hmm. You know. And and as we've talked about, it, it has to start from the top and it has to swell from the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be a collective action mm -hmm. that's that's taking place. You know, through the in, the entire system. Yeah. And just having a billion dollars isn't the end all. You know, there's more to it than just this humongous accumulation of, of wealth and mass materiality. It, it needs to be about saving our planet, mm. okay? Yeah. Because we're about ready to abandon it, or it's going to abandon us. I mean, I always wonder about sci-fi, and we've been trying to get off the planet. I can see why, mm. okay? Because it's, it's in trouble, it's, it's you know, so. So it's, it's not just the human capital, it's also the, the planet itself. We've got about three minutes here, so closing statements. Who wants to lean into it? Give me your parting shot here. We have about 45 seconds left. Don't be shy. Just real briefly, the, 
I, the billion dollars would be pretty nice to set out some counter narratives to the mm. billions that are behind the central narrative. Mm. So I would like to see uh, some of that. I'm also reminded quickly of of um, some work that uh, Robert Nash did when he talked about how to have moral conversation. Mm. And some of the things that he said, two of the, one, the ones that come to mind right now to me are one, the, the, the conversation, somebody's in, in moral conversation, the initial statement that somebody makes at least deserves initial acceptance. Mm. Doesn't need to be, you mm. know, before, in, before it gets interrogated, and it should be interrogated, mm -hmm. it deserves initial ex acceptance. And the other thing that he suggested, and I may start using this more in my classrooms, especially when we talk about controversial topics, is I have to see the air in my own view and the truth in my opponent's view before I mm -hmm. enter into that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I just like those strategies. Thank yeah. you. I'm just reflecting on a lot that was said because I found it very personally valuable. One of the things that um, I've been thinking about a lot lately is how to um, be more, I guess one way to say it would be be more present to the process of the educational interaction and less to the end, what I have presumed to be the goal mm -hmm. or the objective that I've s set forth. Not to say that there shouldn't be goals and intentionality, but um, I think that sometimes um, in the social justice circles in which I, I was kind of raised up, um, we spent more time talking about the goal of social justice than the process mm -hmm. and how to do that process. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so much joy in mm -hmm. the community engagement and to see that as um, a, a reason to stay in, in the difficulty. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about the neighborhoods mm -hmm. um, that I'm a part of, and um, no, my property value is not high, um, but um, my neighbors are up in my business. We have, mm -hmm. you know, potlucks. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. are, there are moments every day to be cherished and mm -hmm. um, celebrated that mean as much, if not more, maybe, then um, how much I'm going to leave to the next generation with the sale after I die. Mm -hmm. I would say in the few seconds left that um, to your last point around climate and around the planet uh, is that this is a moment like no other in our species history. And it is, um, it is an opportunity for us to actually rise to our best selves as a human family and say that we will leave no one behind and say that we will live by our highest values and ideals and say that we choose peace and we choose justice and we choose community over greed and avarice and fear. And so this moment in terms of what we're facing around our climate reality, that is pushing us to the brink of this choice. And I'm going to give everything I've got in every last minute I have of my life toward that end of working for social justice, particularly racial justice given my white dominance, in the context of transforming um, and supporting and betressing our capacity as a species to handle this with as much grace and dignity as we possibly can. Outstanding. I'd like to thank each of you for your contributions. What a wonderful discussion. And, um, Hope it fed your soul out there. So thank you um, very much. And uh, thank you. bless you and keep the good work going. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you.